first of all, I wanted to start out by thanking you all for being here. Uh, this is something that I've been passionate about for a long time. Uh, I was fully growing up, and uh, that really started to help inform my desire to speak out about it and, and, and share a little bit more, and hopefully raise awareness and, and raise a level of education. And I just want to take a, a minute to kind of talk about me and uh, why I'm standing up here. Um, and a lot of that comes back to what I was just talking about. Um, starting in elementary school and up through about the first year of my college experience, I was bullied pretty heavily, um, mostly verbally and socially. Um, sometimes through exclusion or other indirect tactics, sometimes through direct uh, insults, um, through harassment, uh, and for a variety of things. And a lot of it just came from around me being different. Um, I've even been bullied as an adult. Uh, even later in my life, uh, I, I'm I'm different. I like to wear suits and ties to L every day. Uh, it's part of who I am, and uh, I love it. And most of the time, people you know compliment me, say I look nice, but people also like to try to tear me down because of it. And um, all of those experiences really drove me to learn as much as I could about bullying and then to try to share as much as I can with as many people as I can, because I firmly believe that if we understand the issue more, that we may be able to make a difference. And even if that's a, just a small difference, uh, it can have a huge impact. I volunteer with Big Brothers Big Sisters, and I have a little that I work with. Uh, he's about to turn 12 years old this week. Yeah. And uh, last year, I helped his uh, mother identify that he was being bullied in school, and we learned uh, that he was suicidal. Um, it was a very hard thing to go through, um, partially because it took me back to some of my own experiences, but I feel honored that I was able to be there for him, and that I was able to work with his mom and uh, work with his school to help him get out of danger and uh, he's he's still in the, the healing process of, of, go, of having dealt with that but um, he's here he's uh, not here here he's not in the room uh, there are no 12 years old 12 year old people here that I can see um, but uh, he's he's doing better uh, but he's still healing and uh, I'm I'm proud that I could be a part of that healing process. Um, we hopefully the clicker will work in a minute. Did you turn it off? Or is it showing red or green? Hey, you sound Technology is great. Sound is nice and loud. There we go. Um, I think one of the most important things that we have to remember is that none of us are alone. And that goes for both people who are being bullied and the people who have kids, or who have kids in their lives, or who are just a part of a community. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all are, whether we have kids in our lives or not. We are still a part of this community, we're a part of the larger community, and as members of that community, we can make a difference. I felt like I was alone before. I'm pretty sure that I've made people feel like they've been alone before. Uh, it, it's hard for me to admit it sometimes, but I know that there have been things that I've done that if they weren't exactly bullying, uh, there were certainly behaviors that uh, hurt people, things that I said or things that I did uh, that have hurt people in my life, people that I cared about. Uh, but I didn't think about it from their perspective. And I think that's something that's so important to do. I'm grateful that I have the ability to think in those terms now, but I obviously didn't always have that ability. Uh, this is just a picture of me that uh, we, I took with words that other people have used to describe me um, in different parts of my life. 
I think it's important to remember that bullying absolutely can be physical. I mean, we saw a lot of the really damaging things that people were doing in that movie. It, it was very hard for me to watch. I'm sure it was hard for some of you to watch. And it's also important to remember that words have a power to them, that they can hurt just as much as a physical blow. But we don't always think about it in those terms, and I, I think it's important to remember that. Uh, so that's why I wanted to share this picture. <clears throat> These are just a few things that people say about bullying. The problem is that the advice may work sometimes. I mean, that's why we hear it, right? Just stand up and, uh, for yourself. Say something, do something, fight back. People say those things all the time, and they do sometimes work. We heard a story of a kid who uh, stood up for himself, and the people stopped bullying him, stopped paying attention to him, just treating him like he was some other kid. So it does work sometimes, but it's important to remember that there are consequences for those actions sometimes. Sometimes you try to stand up for yourself and you make it worse. You're escalating instead of de-escalating. Even if that one time you were able to overpower your bully and show them that they couldn't treat you that way, that one time, that bully might have friends. And is it really worth it to solve violence with more violence, whether that's physical or verbal or social? I don't think so. But I also think it's important to define what bullying actually is. Because I think the term gets thrown around a lot, and while there are lots of behaviors that do not technically classify as bullying, they are still harmful and still uh, wrong to use, but I do think it's important to say exactly what it is. So what it is is specifically when one or more individuals use behavior with intention of hurting or humiliating another person but it also has to be repeatedly. So if I insult you once, that's not bullying. If I do it repeatedly, it is. Now, if I insult you once, that doesn't mean that I was doing something that was okay, right? I was still hurting you, even if it was only that once. And if it's not just that I said it once, but then that Gwen also said it to you, or John also said it to you. Just because I did it once doesn't make it bullying doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Every seven minutes, every seven minutes, a kid is bullied on the playground. I, I just want to, I'm going to just let you guys read, and I'm just going to show you a few statistics, because I think they speak for themselves. Um, there are statistics that I, I've gathered from a number of sources, National, National Education Association study, um, national psychologists, uh, school psychologists, um, CDC, these are all extremely reputable sources that show us how prevalent this is. How this doesn't affect some small group of people. It doesn't affect just the weird people or the people who are gay or who are, on, you know, have trouble interacting socially. This happens to millions of people. Every day. And the effects of bullying reach far beyond what happens in a specific incident. One of the things that really hits me when I watch that movie is that scene where Alex's mom is trying to talk to him about what she had seen happen to him. She's trying to explain what a friend is. And he, he says, if, if I don't, if those people aren't my friends, who are? He's gone through this so much, it's become such a part of who he is, that it's normal for him. That shouldn't be normal for anybody. But for a lot of us, it has become normal, or it is normal. These are some of the things that happen as a result of bullying. Increase in depression, increase in use of drugs, lowered grades, migraines. It's not just 
mental effects. It can also be physical effects on your body because of what you're enduring from bullying, whether it's physical or not. Seventy-five percent of children don't talk about the bullying that they go through. I'm just reiterating that because every time I read that statistic, it hurts me. Because I never told anybody. And I know that most of the people who deal with bullying on a day-to-day -day basis aren't ever going to tell. They're not going to tell for a lot of reasons, most of which are actually really good. They're not going to tell because the one time that they did tell, nobody listened. Nobody did anything. They're not going to tell because they get advice like, just stand up for yourself. They're not going to tell because they were threatened that if they told anybody, it would get worse. These are the things that we know about bullying. That through countless studies are demonstrated over and over again. Another part of the movie that always really hurts me is seeing that assistant principal and how she reacts when she's confronted directly with incidents of bullying. Because one in four teachers don't see anything wrong with those kinds of behaviors. Four percent. Four percent of the time is how frequently a teacher will intervene in a situation of bullying. Now part of that is not their fault. Part of that is because they are responsible for tens if not hundreds of kids. And the ability to see everything that is going on is impossible. Even in a room of only 30 kids, where you're all in the same room at the same time. It is impossible for you to know everything that every kid is saying and doing at every second of the day. And so bullying is going to occur, and there's going to be times where teachers cannot be aware and cannot do anything. But it is also true, as we saw, that there are teachers who will see what's happening, who will have it put in front of their face, and they will still not do anything. That has to change. Because that many kids wish that a teacher would do something. So I'm going to ask you guys to do a little exercise for me. Um, if you haven't grabbed a piece of paper, please do. Um, if you don't feel like participating, that's fine as well. Um, but I just want you to draw a box in the center of your piece of paper. And in the, inside the box, I want you to write I want you to write uh, things people have done or said to you that have made you feel bullied, unsafe, or hurt. While you're doing that, I want to uh, share a story. If, uh, John doesn't mind me including a story from when we were in college. Um, <clears throat> when we were in college, uh, John and I were both part of the, the same group of uh, friends. We had even formed a club together. And uh, it was all around people being geeks. 
We liked role-playing games. We liked science fiction and fantasy. Uh, we liked things that weren't considered cool. And it was great to feel like there was an outlet for that. There, where you could go and you could just be yourself and people wouldn't judge you for that. I'm, I'm incredibly saddened by the fact that uh, while that was a great community, uh, I was not always a great member of that community. Uh, John and I joke about it now, but uh, there were times where we would gather together and uh, I would sit and I would toss pennies at him. Cool. Uh, at the time, I thought it was harmless. And maybe it was, at least from my perspective. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that my intentions aside, that was not a, an acceptable thing for me to be doing. And there are, are countless other examples uh, of things that I've done in my life that have insulted, hurt, demeaned other people in the same kinds of ways that I have been. I think we live in a society where it's sometimes hard to take a step back and really put ourselves in other people's positions. I would encourage everybody who's here today to think a little bit about the words we choose on a daily basis, how we interact with other people, and how we can maybe make small differences in other people's lives. Because I can tell you right now, there are people in my life who regularly say things that humiliate and demean me to this day. And sometimes, I laugh along with it, and sometimes that's because it was genuinely funny, and sometimes it's because that's the only way that I know how to deal with that. Has everybody had a chance to write some things down in their box? Okay, I want to have you take a, another couple of minutes, and this time I want you to write outside of the box. I want you to write things that you have done or said that might make people feel bullied, unsafe, or insulted. And I want you to really think about it. Because most of the time, we're not bully or victim. Most of the time, there are things that we have done that hurt other people. And there are things that other people have done to us that hurt us. And I think through introspection, we can spend a little time and just be aware of those things. One of the words that we chose to describe this with was to raise awareness. And I think the movie does that to an extreme degree all on its own, but I also think it's important to talk about these things and be open about the fact that none of us are uh, paragons here. None of us are saints. We've all done things that we may regret or that we wish we hadn't. And we've all had things done to us that should never happen. As you finish up writing, I'm going to move on a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the w different ways people can bully. Because I think it's important to distinguish between 
both direct bullying and indirect bullying. I mentioned that distinction a little bit up front, but I'm just going to share a few slides here that show specific examples of first direct bullying. and then indirect bullying. Indirect's a little bit harder, right? Because it's about not me saying that you are something, but using other people to do that, or using a group to exclude. When I was in middle school, I sat alone in the lunchroom every day. And I felt completely alone. There are a lot of warning signs for depression that we can be on the lookout for to see if we know somebody who may be bull being bullied. Now, these don't necessarily mean that if you meet somebody who's depressed, they're being bullied, right? Uh, lots of people are depressed for any number of other reasons. But these can be indicative. So these are some of the ways that I use warning signs to identify that my little, from Big Brothers Big Sisters, was being bullied. Because he wasn't co coming and talking to anybody about the fact that he was being bullied. He didn't want to talk. He was one of the you know, 75% who doesn't tell anybody. But I noticed and heard from his mother that his grades were slipping, and that he was acting out at home, and he was depressed. And that he, was, he would stop doing things that he loved doing. And this is a kid who loves reading, who loves playing the piano, who loves music, and he wasn't engaging in any of those things. And so I asked his mom if she thought maybe there's bullying going on, and she said that she had no idea. Uh, he wouldn't talk to her. So I tried to talk to him, and at first he wouldn't tell me anything. So I asked him if I could tell him a story. So I told him a story about one of the times when I felt like I was alone and I was being bullied and I couldn't tell anybody, even my parents. And I told him that it's 20 years later and one of the things that I regret most is that I never told my parents because I, I know now that my mom would fight for me. She would have done anything she could have to help protect me. But at the time, I felt like, I felt ashamed. And so I told him all this, and he was, he was really quiet for a few minutes. And then he asked me if I thought that it was okay to talk to his parents about something. I told him that he should absolutely talk to his parents, or he should talk to a teacher that he trusts, or he could talk to me. Over the next couple of days, he talked to me and he talked to his mom, and we learned that he was being hit and kicked in school, that people were threatening him. So, warning signs are incredibly important. We have to be aware that we're not going to often hear that somebody's being bullied. Because, as we saw from the statistics, most kids won't tell you, most teachers either won't see it, or they will excuse it as some other kind of behavior. But we have to be vigilant about these things. Where bullying can happen, playgrounds, locker rooms, really though it's anywhere where uh, often it's places that are unsupervised, 
right? Places where there's not a clear authority figure looming directly over you. But that could be anywhere. That could be a corner of a classroom. That could be a hallway, that could be a bathroom. There are very few places that we can completely control as adults, as children, anywhere. And because of that, pretty much anywhere is where bullying is happening. So I want to switch the conversation a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about how to engage with kids and what we can actually do to help kids. Because it's all well and good for me to stand up here and say we have a bullying problem and that we need to do something, but then what? So one of the first things that is absolutely critical is to stay calm if you find out that somebody that you care about is being bullied. It's, it can be hard to do that, especially if it's your kid or it's your family member or somebody that you care deeply about because honestly, one of my first reactions is I wanna go into that school, I wanna to talk to people, I wanna understand what's going on and I want this to stop right now. We don't need to talk about this anymore, I can just go and do this. I can take care of everything and everything will be okay. The fact is that's uh, almost impossible, if not impossible. So the first step is to stay calm. Open questions. So especially if you think that a kid might be getting bullied versus you actually know that they are being bullied, it can be, as I illustrated with my example, it can be very difficult to get them to actually talk about it. And if you're asking yes, no questions like, are you being bullied? They're going to answer with a yes or a no. And maybe even then they're not gonna answer accurately. So you need to ask open-ended questions that are going to tell you more about what their life at school or in other environments is actually going to be like. <coughs> Talk to them about the people that they spend time with, about their experiences riding on the bus, or in the cafeteria, or something like that, where they're actually talking about a specific thing instead of, how's your day? When I was a kid and my mom asked me how my day was, I said, fine. That was very rarely the case. It was usually a crazy mixture of fun parts and horrible parts and times where I just wanted to curl up into a ball and go away, and times where I felt like everything was amazing. Another useful tool is hypothetical scenarios, right? So uh, give kids hypotheticals so that they're not acknowledging that this is actually happening to them, while also allowing them space to talk about a situation that may be occurring to them. And these are just tools, right? So I can't prescribe any one solution that's gonna help uh, if you find out that somebody's being bullied. Uh, because simply put, every situation is going to be different. So one of the keys there becomes actually actively engaging with the kid in trying to figure out how to deal with the bully. So, Again, this goes back to, the, to what I was saying about how my impulse is to say, okay, let's figure out how to deal with this. And to uh, go in and deal with it directly. But if you do that, you're also taking away from the kid. They're not being empowered to deal with the bullying themselves. And they may not be comfortable with the solutions that you come up with. That may be because they're worried about escalation, it may be because they're worried that other kids will start picking on them because you ratted them out. 
So here are a few different tactics for a supporter, which I'm assuming is going to be most of us in this room since uh, very few of us seem to be school age, but uh, who knows, maybe some of us are. Um, very quickly, I talked to some about uh, a few of these. Stay calm, be supportive, listen to them. I, I can't stress that one enough because if the kid doesn't feel like you're actually listening to what they're telling you, then they're going to shut off. Praise them for talking to you, remove them from danger, include them in decisions, help them build up their self-esteem, give them the option of seeking counseling. Again, all of these are tools that you could potentially use. They're not prescriptive. They're not saying do each of these in this order. Um, but I do think as a general rule, a lot of these are going to be very helpful in starting that conversation and trying to help them on to the path of healing. If any of us are dealing with being bullied, because certainly bullying does not exist only inside the walls of a school, these are some tactics that we can all take. One of the ones I really want to highlight here is Talk to somebody. It is probably the easiest one, but also the hardest one to actually start. Could you flip back a second? Of course. Can I read that later? Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. I also want to talk about a person that's not always talked about in uh, conversations about bullying, and that's the bystander. That is, if I'm standing up here and John starts hurling insults at me, and you all sit there and do nothing, or you laugh at some of the things that he says, you are all bystanders. And in most situations of bullying, bullying stems primarily from a, a desire to wield power over somebody else. So most of the time, bullying is going to occur with an audience. So most of the times, there's going to be bystanders. And most of the time, those bystanders are either not going to do anything, they're going to stay quiet, or they are going to uh, facilitate by laughing or by uh, joining in in some way. And that, speaking from experience, that can hurt as much, if not more, than the actual bullying that's happening. So there's a few things that, if any of us are in that, the situation where we're witnessing somebody being bullied, that we can do. Um, again, these are options. They are not. Uh, they are not hard and fast. But I do want to highlight one in particular, uh, and that is be supportive of the victim in private. I think something that gets forgotten a lot is that you can go to somebody after you witness something, and if you did not feel safe saying something in that moment or doing something in that moment because of any number of reasons, because you feared that, that would, the bully's aggression would be turned on you, because uh, you worried about the victim's safety and that if you said something or did something, that even if it wasn't right that moment, that some, the bully would do even worse to the victim. Pulling the victim aside, and having a private conversation with them and saying, I saw what happened, I'm sorry, that should not have happened. Letting them know that one, they're not alone, that you did not in any way condone what happened, and that you wanted to reach out to them can have an enormous impact. It decreases the likelihood of 
depression and suicidal thoughts exponentially. Just that little moment of outreach, letting them know that they're not alone. So hopefully none of us in this room will ever have to deal with bullying again, either in people that we care about or in our own experiences. But realistically speaking, in some way we're probably going to have to deal with it. And if there's one thing that I could really just leave everybody with, it's that tactic. Remember that you can always say something to them privately. So I want to leave with a few resources, and I want to leave uh, time for people to ask questions and um, potentially to start another discussion. But um, these are just a few resources, and I also included my email up here at the bottom, uh, infopio at redwoodsgroup.com. You can email me directly, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have that for whatever reason you didn't feel like you could ask here. I'm also happy to uh, share more resources, more information, start a larger conversation, any of those things, um, please feel free to, to reach out to me directly. So uh, at this point, I'll just open things up for questions, and then we'll go from there. An incident, I might almost call it life-changing incident, happened when I was about mm, 12, maybe. Um, these kids from some other school, city school or something, it's a rural area, mm -hmm. uh, three of them, like leather jackets and chains and push blades, I mean everybody carried knives back then, but um, they were bigger kids, you know, like maybe even held back or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. thugs basically, three of them, and, they, and, and this is on the bus, which is where a lot of this kind of stuff happens. They came at me, and there were like these. I was like a little kid, but these were mostly older kids, you know. And there's all these teenage girls, right, and other uh, teenagers watching. And they came down there, and they told me to get out of the way, punk or something, you know, just move mm -hmm. something. They were like, you know, some aggressive sort of comment like that. And seeing all that they're being witnessed by all these other kids, and I'm so much smaller than they are, I said, no. Like, what are you gonna do, beat up on a little kid? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, really. So they're like looking at each other, and they didn't know what to do. And they walk around me, <laughs> and they just kind of push past me back to the, toward the back of us. And that worked. That one incident worked that time, doesn't always work, I know. You know, things don't always work, but that helped shape who I am, and I've done similar things many times since then. Not always successfully, but <laughs> you know, um, sometimes uh, an event that works, whatever it might be, it might be something different, is, um, you know, a, a learning experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, as you say, that it can be life changing. Right. Right. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, I forgot to mention that John's actually going to come around with a microphone so it's easier for everybody to hear the questions. And um, so. Hold it really close. <laughs> I'm going to have to just talk loud. Um, so uh, thank you so much for presenting and for. John for organizing this and for everyone for coming. Um, it's either not on or not on. Not on, on or I, I mean, we can use his mic and, and it's a I can just, just speak it's loud. It's not on at all. all. It is. Oh, oh, It is. Now. You really have to. I wasn't kidding. Nope. No, okay. 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 Oh, there you go. There you go. No, so, so when I, I've seen this movie twice now, I think. I watched it on Netflix and then. Now, and the thing that always strikes me is like that assistant principal and the, the dark haired woman who I assume is the principal. Um, and I just, a lot of your presentation dealt with sort of individual actions people can take if they mm -hmm. 
are worried that someone in their life is being bullied or they witness bullying, which is great. But I also, I just, and this is gonna be one of those questions, it's gonna be a statement that ends with a what do you think, but I like, I wanna like kind of pull back and, and, and think a little bit about school uh, and organizational culture that contributes to bullying. Like it, it's really present too in the film when the, one, the, the superintendent is like, oh, well we don't have a problem with bullying. And they can't get uh, someone from the school central office or a school member to show up for a, a meeting about bullying. Um, and so I, I guess I just wonder, like, and I'm curious about the people who are school or have experience in education uh, as educators or in, in administrative positions who might be here, can talk a little bit about, like, what the role of culture plays and organizational culture, because I think about, like, workplace bullying as being mm -hmm. similar, but mm -hmm. it's a little easier to influence, I think, a school's culture. Um, so that's like my question, what do you think? <laughs> well, thank you, Adam. Uh, you know, I, actually, there's, there's a lot of information on both how school culture affects and creates a bullying environment, and then how uh, you can start to uh, really try to change how a school's culture exists to try to lessen or remove bullying. Um, I, act, I actually have a lot of information on that that I'm happy to share. I think one of the key things is uh, getting buy-in from, uh, if not you know, the principal level, the superintendent level, somewhere on that uh, hierarchical stage. Because I think, as we can all guess, uh, if you don't have people who are actively engaged in pursuing a bully-free community, then it's not gonna work. Uh, if a single teacher tries to do things, they're gonna have an impact, and I think that's still incredibly important. And would encourage any teachers, counselors, anything in the audience uh, to still you know, try to do what they can on an individual level, or from a school-wide level, or uh, county level or anything like that, um, I think you need higher level buy-in. Um, and there's a, a suggestion that we maybe, uh, if we do another one of these discussions, we invite some uh, school district level people to, to come and join and participate, and I think that's a great idea. He's one of those guys. Um, and, and maybe we can actually start raising awareness in those organizations. Um, I've done a little bit of work within some local schools and uh, organizations, just with the, the few contacts that I have, but uh, I think anything that we can do to raise that and to uh, hopefully start creating better cultures, because I, I think there are some schools where things are great, right? I mean, uh, you walk around and you see, yeah, things seem pretty good, and the culture seems pretty good, but I think they're also few and far between. And most schools, probably most of the schools we grew up in, uh, were not like that. That uh, they kind of fostered a bullying community, and uh, if not actively kind of encouraged it, they at least, uh, in various ways facilitated it. Turning a blind eye, uh, all those kind of behaviors. Did that help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, so it says a, mm -hmm. a lot to me, like I work in 15 districts and I actually can't answer the question of what does it look like for our, the kids that the organization that I work for serves. And I also think that like, what is, this question it raises questions for me about like when we talk about school violence, what are we measuring? Because you could look up the statistics that you know are available for every district, and it might not give you an actually accurate picture of what it's like. So yeah, that's really I, I, in the data analysis, and 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 I could tell you several stories, but one of the most interesting was that one year a school that had very high numbers, the highest in the district. The very next year, it went to the very lowest in the district, and it was clear. And I, I was talking with people who were in the schools, and it was clearly just bullshit 
Um, <laughs> is it useful? No, they quit counting people, right? I'm sorry, what? They, is it because they quit counting people is why the numbers went down? Well, it just falls by the numbers. Make, I mean, there's many ways to do that. They didn't make the complaint form available anymore, so the statistics went down. Is that what you're saying, maybe? Right, there's all different ways to do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and, but if there's an effort to change those numbers, they'll use all those different tactics and techniques to do that. Yeah, and, and I guess... And it's just, just paper shuffling, it's just well, pencil with it. There needs to be a better way of measuring it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Effectively. Well, even crime statistics. Yeah. Almost the only crime statistic you can trust is murder. The same thing. You know, there needs to be a better way. Not even that sometimes. Uh, really quickly, I want to follow up with Adam, and then uh, we have some more questions. So, uh, Adam, a couple things. One. Uh, I would look at which of those areas are teaching any form of social or emotional intelligence. Uh, I think that's a key component is uh, not just teaching uh, sort of the core curriculum, but also teaching uh, kids how to understand things like empathy and how to have empathy, because that's an incredibly important thing to be able to understand what somebody else is feeling starts you on that path to being able to say, wait a second, the words that I'm using are hurtful. Maybe I shouldn't be using those words. Uh, another thing uh, is that I have a semi-curriculum for uh, stages of setting up a task force of uh, identifying problem areas inside of schools and school districts um, that I'd be happy to share that can help start to shape what that might look like. Other question? Did you have a question? Yeah. I wonder if you comment on the, um, I actually can talk pretty loud. You know? okay. um, clearly the most, one of the most, uh, this gentleman referred to a painful episode was when that assistant principal was stonewalling, I believe it was Alex, his, parents in that office. And um, I couldn't, I kept thinking what I might, I probably would have done the, exactly the wrong thing. Um, when you say be calm, I know you mean be calm with the, the victim. But um, I thought the father, I kept hoping the father would say something. Uh, his wife, the mother, was doing all the talking, and I wonder if, if being calm, he took it to a, a bit to an extreme there, and, and maybe, I, I guess I would like a critique of um, the advocacy level of the mo mother and father. Uh, I credit the mother for initiating it, but you had a thing up there, uh, one of the criteria was remove the kid, the child from danger, and it was very tepid, you know, well, uh, he can't ride that bus anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, well, I think the assistant principal suggested another bus. Well, there's no guarantee he won't be bullied on that bus, and that was all sort of left very nebulous. And, um, and that it was pictures and, of the grandkids. Yeah, well, it was okay. yeah, oh, and that, and that, that tactic of, I love children, look, I have the little yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. was shameless. Yeah. And also, the father, if I, and, and I'll finish, when he asked his son at home, um, what happened on the bus today? Was there a problem on the bus? And Alex mm -hmm. said, yeah, this, this guy calls me his B and then chokes me. And the father said, to, a, to kind of diffuse this, well, if you don't stand up for yourself, your sister will be bullied. Mm -hmm. Doesn't even address what's happening to the kid mm -hmm. in real time. Yeah. No, I mean, he doesn't know how. Good God. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if 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 you if your parents can't advocate for you, yeah, uh, uh, clearly the assistant principal was just blowing smoke. Yeah. I mean, people like that should be. Did fire uh, it should, should be drummed <laughs> oh, should be God. drummed yeah, out like out of the school like that. Like that. Huh? It's training. It's oh. PR training. It's very yeah. professional. Yeah. People in positions like that are actually trained how to deal with parental complaints and criticisms. They they have 
They have pamphlets and instruction materials for assistant principals and principals right. to deal with parental complaints. That's correct. And that's, that the kind of thing she was saying was straight out of those materials. Mm -hmm. They're trained to do this. They, they're trained to dismiss. So a few right. things. Um, well, uh, there, there, there's a lot in, in what you said because you know I, there's a lot I agree with. Um, I do want to comment on uh, what you were kind of looking for in terms of critique. So uh, first of all, I want to talk for a second about the data because um, that's a piece that really struck a chord with me because it's not just that he's uh, deflecting or not dealing directly with. Uh, what his son is telling him about uh, what's happening to him. He is shaming him yes, exactly. for yes. being bullied on that bus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that ties directly uh, in an interesting way to that later scene that you were talking about where uh, they're in the assistant principal's office and he's very quiet. He says nothing. I don't think that he... And this is pure supposition, right? Because all we know about him is what we see in the, the movie. But uh, I don't think that he really understands what's happening to his son. And uh, I, I think because of that, he is uh, not equipped to be an advocate for his son. I think his mother's better equipped, but when you're dealing with a bureaucracy like a school system, it can be disheartening, to say the least, when, uh, you know, she mentions this even, that uh, after they leave the school, and she, the, the assistant principal says something like, you know, uh, we'll look into it, we'll try to figure out what to do. And she, they leave the school, and the mom says, I think that's what she told us in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> when you're dealing with that level of frustration and ineptitude, because nothing is happening. This is something that keeps being brought up, and all that happens is the kids are brought in, and they talk about it a little bit, and clearly nothing really happens to any of the kids who are involved, right? We don't see any real action happen. Uh, well, they might have had to shake hands. They might have had to shake oh. hands. That was another scene that is really upsetting to me. Yeah. Uh, in baby talk, yeah. shake hands. Go, go back in there and make out. Uh, uh, right. But when you deal with that kind of stonewalling, I think is the word you use, and I think that's a, a, an incredibly accurate term, there's an understandable, uh, almost immediate defeatism to it. You know, you're not going to get anywhere, so what's the point in getting angry? And I think it's very interesting the impact that the parents had that were not being talked to by the school at all, who were not participating in uh, the town hall meetings or anything like that, and yet those parents were having a much larger impact because they were bringing the community together to change something instead of worrying about how am I gonna get this fixed through this school system. Because unfortunately, for any number of reasons, school systems are not necessarily going to be the best advocates for this. Um, now, I think that there are uh, plenty of schools, plenty of teachers, plenty of administrators who do care deeply about this issue, who are trying to make a huge difference, and uh, I applaud and, and I'm incredibly proud of every single one of those people, uh, because it's not always easy to do and it's important work, but I think there is far too much of it still to do if we're seeing the kind of numbers that we're looking at, where we aren't seeing these incidents being accurately reported. Uh, we're seeing way too many people turning a blind eye to it or excusing it. I just, it, it can't keep on like that. <laughs>